from, and I am really pleased to have you all joining us for office hours today. Um, just an introduction to myself quickly, I'm a faculty member at Duke University and also a member of the ARIS leadership team. Um, that was not me. <laughs> if you could all mute, that, <laughs> that would be great. It looks like someone is uh, skydiving their way into the Zoom meeting today, so that's a first for me. But um, All right, uh, so now I'm totally off off track and flustered. Um, but it's great to have people joining us today. Um, it, it looks like we definitely are gonna have um, a bigger crowd than we often get at these Eris office hours. And I, I think that's great. I'm wonder it's wonderful to see all these um, new faces. I, I think um, probably a lot of you are not Eris regulars. Um, and I think the reason for that is that today's topic is one that I think is a bit more broad and interdisciplinary. A, a lot of our Eris office hours topics tend to be pretty um, pretty focused on sort of the specifics of broader impacts. And this one obviously spans broader impacts, but also science communication. And so I think we have, um, I know I spread the word through a lot of science communication lists that, that I'm on. Um, and so I think that's why we have a lot of new faces, which is wonderful. Um, it's also a chance for me to introduce ARIS to a bunch of new people. And so um, I wanna just quickly mention what ARIS is for those of you who are newbies and, and aren't familiar with us. Um, so ARIS is the Center for Advancing Research Impact in Society. Um, and this is a, a national center for broader impacts and research impact support. Uh, it's based at the University of Missouri and it's funded by the National Science Foundation through a $5.2 million grant. It's a five-year grant, we're about halfway through. Um, and we always like to point out that every single directorate within the NSF contributed to the funding of ARIS. So um, that just shows how important the NSF thinks broader impacts is across the board and how important it is to support that. So um, uh, what ARIS does, we work with scientists and with impacts, research impacts, broader impacts professionals to um, build capacity, advance scholarship, grow partnerships, and, and generally promote um, discussion and policy and practice around broader impacts and research impacts. Um, for those of you who are new to ARIS, I encourage you all to check out our website, which is research, uh, researchinsociety.org, one word, research in society. Um, and I wanna encourage you to consider joining ARIS. We actually are allowing people to join for free through the end of 2021. So. Um, you can join and become a member of ARIS and become part of our community, which is a really wonderful, robust, lively community. Okay, so that's who ARIS is. And um, I, I wanted to just quickly, um, before we jump into this, I want to give a, a quick comment on um, <clears throat> why I'm so excited about today's session and why I think it's really important. Um, in my job at Duke, uh, I wear two main hats. One is as a science communication um, director of a science communication initiative and a faculty member who teaches science communication courses and runs a lot of SciComm training. Um, the other hat I wear is running an office of broader impact support at um, Duke. And um, for a long time, I've been talking about sort of the interrelatedness of science communication and broader impacts. Um, I've also pretty much throughout my whole career been working um, uh, pretty intensively on diversity issues in STEM. And so this uh, session today really kind of checks all my boxes, science communication, broader impacts, diversity. And um, I first really learned about the, the inclusive SciComm movement, I guess, a few years ago when I heard about the inclusive SciComm symposium, which was something that was created and organized by one of our speakers today, Sunshine Menezes, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, I wasn't able to attend the first symposium a couple of years ago, but I did attend last fall last fall, I think, December, when was it? Yeah, sometime around then. Um, anyway, it was a fantastic session and it really energized me and it's made me um, think about how to bring the discussion about inclusive SciComm into the broader impacts community more directly uh, ever since then. And so um, we've been doing these office hours for a few months now and I thought this would be a great topic and a great opportunity to, to sort of merge all of these areas. So that's why I'm really excited about this and we have um, two terrific presenters today. So I'll introduce them and then hand it off to them. Um, the first, as I mentioned, is Dr. Sunshine Menezes. 
Um, Sunshine is the executive director of the Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island and is a clinical associate professor of environmental communication there. Um, as I mentioned in 2018, she created the Inclusive SciComm Symposium and she'll undoubtedly be telling us more about that in just a couple minutes. Um, Sunshine received her BS in zoology from Michigan State University, uh, so she's a Spartan, um, and her PhD in biological oceanography from University of Rhode Island. Um, our other speaker is Dr. Katie Canfield. Katie works in science communication, public engagement, and environmental justice, and critical tourism studies. And she's currently a postdoc uh, with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, Katie received her BS and MA in environmental studies from USC, University of Southern California. So we have our own little Greek war here. We've got a Spartan and a Trojan going at it today, actually teaming up, collaborating. So that's good to see. Um, and Katie also received her PhD from University of Rhode Island in marine affairs. Um, so that's a, an introduction to our speakers. Uh, the last thing I wanna say really quickly is um, it's too much for my old tired mind to monitor the chat room and moderate the discussion, but please, I encourage you, if you have questions, um, put them in the chat room. Um, one of my ARIS colleagues will be sort of monitoring the chat room for any questions you have for your speakers. Um, and so feel free at any point to put questions in there. And um, we're gonna hear from our speakers for maybe 20 or 30 minutes, I think, and then open it up to questions from all of you. So enough of my yapping, um, Katie and Sunshine, please um, take it away. Thank you, Jory. Um, can everybody see my screen, my slides? Yep, you're good. Uh, wonderful, thank you. Um, so first of all, um, on behalf of Katie and me both, I'd like to thank um, Eris and Jory specifically for reaching out and inviting us to talk today. Really excited to share um, the results from a landscape study that we've been working on with you all today. We, we don't have time to talk about everything, but we're gonna share some highlights that are really relevant to the issue of broader impacts. And um, also thanks to Jory for letting us know that there is a pretty broad, a, a, like a very broad range of people attending this particular program today in terms of your career stage, your experience with broader impacts, um, your role specifically. So um, we have designed this, this short presentation with that in mind. And obviously if you want any clarifying questions, then please feel free to share those. So um, first, I'd like to note that this landscape study that we'll be talking about today was funded by the Kavli Foundation. We're very grateful for their support. The Kavli Foundation has, um, has this great model of funding small-scale landscape studies related to public engagement with science. And they're, um, they're small-scale, so there are not a huge number of people who are interviewed to inform the study, but it gives all of us working broadly in this public engagement sphere, um, a, a way to investigate further a particular question that we may have. And in this case, the question is, what is going on with the inclusive science communication movement? And Katie and I have agonized over what to call this. We have settled on movement because we feel that it is the, the best term at this point, at least, um, for what's happening. And we'll explain more about that in a minute. I'd also like to thank the advisory group that has been helping us with this study um, since the beginning, and a number of other people, including several who are on this call, who have um, participated as ambassadors and, and just kind of thought partners. Um, one other thing I'd like to note before I move on is that we are referring to science communication here in its absolute broadest sense. So we're defining this as any information exchange designed to engage targeted audiences in conversations about STEM topics. So that means that, um, kind of back to what, what Joy was saying before, without a doubt, broader impacts in science communication um, are not only overlapping, but in our very broad definition, they're, they're very closely related. Okay, um, that said, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, and then I'm gonna hand this over to Katie, who's gonna share uh, some of the results with you. So as Jory mentioned, we launched this in 2018 at the University of Rhode Island, and it, at that point, was a response to the fact that there, um, just there wasn't a lot of conversation, broad conversation happening about 
inclusion and equity specifically in science communication. There were absolutely um, pockets of, of individuals and um, programs and collaborators who were doing this work already. So we're not claiming that this is new, but what was missing was an opportunity to bring all of these different people together. And also importantly, to help those of us, whether we're just learning about this for the first time, or we're really like starting in on it for real, or we've been doing it for a while, to help all of us recognize that we have a lot to learn across disciplines and across what we're calling modes or approaches toward science communication. So that was the goal. And so we had this one and a half day symposium with approximately 150 attendees. And by day two, everybody was saying, okay, so what's happening next year? What are we gonna do next year? Which frankly was not something we had even thought about yet. Um, but the, that great interest then led us to do it a second time in 2019. We expanded it to three days. We had an open call for abstracts based on themes that the planning committee had established. Also shout out to all the planning committee members on this symposium. And um, just it's, it's really spawning this and helping to support and develop this incredible community of people that is um, not only across the US, but in fact, international. Um, so, okay, so I think that's it. That's what I wanted to say about the symposium. Like I said, you can visit the website there and you can find all kinds of information about it. I should also note that on that website, we actually have a link, which I'll share with you directly to a lot of inclusive SciComm related resources that you may find helpful. And this is a Google Doc, so you can add to it as you see fit. And with that, I will hand it over to Katie. Great, so Sunshine has been talking a lot about, and the title of this is Inclusive SciComm or Inclusive Science Communication. Um, so we've worked hard to come up with a definition of what exactly inclusive science communication means. So um, the definition that we lay out in this paper that the slide is of right here um, explains that inclusive science communication, as we define it, is a paradigmatic shift that recognizes the history of oppression and discrimination of marginalized identities in STEM and centers the voices of those marginalized individuals and communities in STEM dialogue. Um, additionally, um, it takes an intersectional approach, recognizing that people's characteristics and identities overlap um, and they affect the way we interact with the world. Uh, additionally, another characteristic is that the different implicit and explicit biases that uh, everyone in the science communication space has affect the way they design and implement science communication work. Um, and it firmly rejects the deficit model of speaking at an audience or the idea that your audience doesn't have any knowledge or experience to contribute to science communication um, and instead embraces an asset based approach um, that respects and values the diverse ideas, experiences and criticisms of everyone involved. Um, and finally, we see inclusive science communication as a way to address the systemic problems of access to STEM. Um, can we go to the next one, please? So, um, as Sunshine mentioned, um, we're, this presentation is largely about a landscape study um, that we've conducted with the support of the Kavli Institute. And this study involved in interview, interviews with 30 leaders in the field, um, or at the movement rather, and focus groups at the 2019 Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science with early career scholars um, at the ARIS Summit back in April. And then there was also a presentation at the Allied Media Conference a couple of months ago, or a month ago about. Um, and these interviews were with leaders across different career stages, different disciplines, different sectors and modes. Um, we have a slide on demographics, if that's something you want to hear more about. Um, but as Sunshine mentioned, it's a constrained study. We only talked to 30 people. Um, for the interviews and then we presented the results, the early results of those to the early career folks at SACNIS last fall um, to gather their insights on um, our findings and discuss what makes, what resonated with them. Uh, 
And then we also did a social network analysis to see what is the network of people involved in this landscape of inclusive science communication. So who is interacting with and working with uh, in the inclusive science communication world. So we've had some, a few key, yeah, you can go to the next one, a few key findings. So first off, we have these three traits that reflect how people either explicitly or implicitly approach inclusive science communication. Um, and the first one being intentionality. So unanimously our interview, interviewees either explicitly or implicitly expressed that they when they practice inclusive science communication, they are very aware of who is their audience, how are they defining science, how are different identities represented and or supported, um, and how are they accounting for that history of marginalization and discrimination in STEM. Um, second, reciprocity. So particularly with participants, interview participants who are more in the practice realm of science communication, um, they were focusing on, is there a mutual benefit? Are we having a conversation rather than um, a lecture? Um, recognizing the assets of the people in the room. Um, and then finally, reflexivity. So sometimes this was personal of assessing what are my identities and how does that affect the way that I'm interacting with my audience. Um, and sometimes it's the motivation a person has to do this work is this is my identity. It's not represented in STEM and therefore I need to um, increase the presence of people with my identities in STEM. Um, for others, it's more at the institutional level, reflexively looking at what is the, what are the different identities represented in my staff? What, what can we do about that? Um, so those were the three key traits. We also had some findings that confirmed some suspicions um, that there are these four, well, not four silos, but there are some serious siloing happening in this movement of science communication. So um, as Sunshine was very um, deliberate in defining the way we define science communication, that's because we noticed that there are these very strict disciplinary um, silos. So people, for example, in museum spaces versus people who are in um, science communication research or um, in formal education, formal science education versus informal science education. There, was, there wasn't a ton of conversation between those communities. Um, and then the modal silos, that refers to the idea that there wasn't a lot, we noticed there wasn't a lot of conversation between people who are practicing inclusive science communication on Twitter and people who practice more in person. There is within those modes and within those disciplines, but not so much between. Um, and we expected there to be um, some distinction between um, and some siloing and lack of communication between those who are more in the practice space as the practitioners of science communication and those who are more in the research academic space of science communication we actually found that um, among our interviewees and particularly early career folks, that there isn't as much of a divide between practice and research as we had anticipated. Many practitioners were quick to note, like, yes, I do research. I ask these questions and I follow a scientific process of answering what is the best way to design this exhibit, for example. And many of the researchers are practicing science communication, be it through Twitter or another mode. Um, and our social network analysis um, re revealed that, that this, uh, particularly these disciplinary and modal silos where people would frequently tell me the um, Twitter handles of people rather than their names, for example, for people who are most engaged in the Twitter sphere. Um, so along with these silos, we also identified a number of challenges that the inclusive science communication movement faces, um, one of them being limited understanding of what the practices might look like to be um, truly inclusive. Um, and uh, they want, there's a lack of depth of understanding of what this might actually look like. Um, additionally, as partially as a result of these silos, there are language barriers where certain disciplines may use one term and others another. Um, one example that we like to point to is like the hashtag, this is what a scientist looks like, um, is used in Twitter, whereas in the academic um, sci ed science education literature, it might be um, 
self-efficacy as a scientist, if you can see yourself as a scientist. An additional challenge is a lack of sense of belonging. So again, coming back to why we define science communication the way we do, we found that a lot of our interviewees didn't identify as science communicators. Um, they didn't feel like they belonged in this science communication realm. They're, they say, oh, I, I work in museums, that's not science communication. Um, so a, a, some very bounded thinking of what that what counts. Um, additionally, people we were talking to that we saw as leaders in this space um, were quick to point that they don't have a ton of deep training in what it means to practice inclusive science communication um, and pointed out that there isn't a ton of opportunities for um, training what it might look like to be an inclusive science communicator um, continually. And so everyone, uh, and along with that lack of training, there are also people who want those recommended practices to do inclusive SciComm right now. Um, but we urge people to recognize that it's not just a list of tips and tricks, but rather um, it's a practice, a movement that requires deep engagement with those, th those key traits. Um, additionally, a challenge we recognized is that the majority of the leadership um, in the field, in the movement is female or people who identify as women rather. Um, and um, there's a need to have diversity or we risk perpetuating inequities of who's being represented. Um, some of the women see this as a good place good thing because it's a space where they're not a minority and they're um, but others worry that it is delegitimizing um, and uh, the field until there's a cis white man who is the leader of the field. Um, we recognize that that's a challenging thing to say, but that's the way that it was perceived by these, these that our interviewees and so it's important to present. Um, and then finally, another important challenge to note is that there's a, a lack of institutional infra infrastructure and support. So this can't be the work of one diversity in STEM person. This can't just be one person's job. It needs to be rather the foundation of the institution um, in order for it to, excuse me, that's my dog. I'm sorry if you can hear him. Um, <laughs> it needs to be the foundation of the institution. So. For a lot of early career folks, this is like that SciComm is their side hustle. Um, there needs to be more funding um, for people to do this work from start to finish. Um, so along with challenges, we also identified a few key pressure points. Um, first, first of all, um, that we need to frame the field in order. So the pressure points are basically points that either could advance or inhibit the advancement of um, inclusive science communication. So first of all, um, it's reframing the way that we look at science communication to so that people can see themselves as a part of this movement. Secondly is the need for um, spaces of learning and networking that people feel like they belong to again. So Twitter is a big space for some people and a lot of people that's really where they do their science communication, but it excludes many other people. I myself cannot keep up with science Twitter. Um, and then the symposium is another one of those spaces, but it's only once or twice, once every one or two years and that's not enough consistency. Um, another thing is scaling up momentum, which leads back into those other um, pressure points where um, we need institutional support not just individual support. We need money that's not gonna expire before we can check did what we what we attempted work, which um, is our final pressure point of evaluation. So we need in order to have practices and a better definition of what this can look like, um, we need to evaluate what we're what we're attempting and what all of these different leaders in the field are doing. This didn't actually come up a lot in conversation. Not many of the interviewees um, said that this was something that they think about a lot. Um, and so we wanted to amplify that as something that um, we can think about, especially in the um, broader impact space, right? That's a part of the conversation is what does what did that broader impact what did that look like what were can we evaluate what those impacts were so we need to do this evaluation or in order to identify what we're calling promising practices 
for inclusive science communication. So promising practices came up from one of our interviewees um, as an alternative term to saying best practices or recommended practices because we don't have enough evidence yet to claim um, that any practices are best, right, or recommended. Um, and we recognize, again, this isn't a brand new term that that interviewee introduced, but rather one that we thought was um, representative of what we're advocating for. So um, if we're going to present some promising practices for now, we'd recommend embedding these key traits of inclusive science communication in, our, in broader impacts work, and that's embedding them at the base at the foundation, that idea of this intentionality of who is your audience, who, what is science, um, the reciprocity of what is the give and take, how can you learn from the people that you're communicating with, and finally, reflexively looking at who are you, who is your in, this, the institution that you represent, and how does that impact the way your audience may receive what it is that you are, you are sharing. Okay, and that, moving over, over to me now. Um, thanks, Katie. So another one of the um, promising practices that we wanted to amplify was the fact that um, whether you're an individual who's doing this, or again, you're part of a program or you're part of an institution, the, this process that is very specific to your setting of adaptive implementation based on those key traits and based on your goals, your audiences and your settings is absolutely essential. And so a great example of this is the STEM ambassador program, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, so this is a, um, an NSF funded project that, that came, grew out of the really phenomenal work that Nalini Nadkarni at University of Utah had done and, and grew into this incredible training program to, to help um, scientists get the, the, the training and experience to do public engagement in much more inclusive ways, specifically to reach audiences who are often left out of, of STEM public engagement efforts. And this builds on the work of um, Julie Rizian and Martin Storksteik, um, who have identified the, the idea of impact identities for scientists, meaning you as a scientist or as a, an, a public engagement professional or a broader impacts professional, bring your own experiences and, and knowledge, et cetera, to all of your interactions. You also should bring your own goals for the kinds of impacts that you want. So one of the things that we really think is fantastic about this STEM ambassador program is that they, they construct this um, engagement effort based on the person who is doing the engaging as well as on the audiences they're trying to reach. So this, this image that we're showing here from, from their website is just a lovely way to show that kind of adaptive implementation in, in practice. Um, Another one of the promising practices that we really wanted to amplify is, you know, critically analyzing your language. And this, uh, this comes out in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, this is about using inclusive language, um, using language that is not going to be completely unrecognizable for people who are in different disciplines. Um, so um, an example of of a term that we also would like to um, urge people to move away from is outreach. And I say that sometimes and people are like, Ooh! you know, they're horrified to hear that because of course, many of us in this space have been using the term outreach for a really long time. But that is such a hierarchical word, you know, it is antithetical to inclusive science communication because it is, it, it inherently says, there is someone inside and there is someone outside and we are going to reach from the inside the like kind of dominant privileged place to the outside. So um, this is one of the ways that we um, are thinking uh, from this study that people can really be more critical about our use of language to break down silos. Um, another one of the clearly um, promising practices here is to truly integrate what is known from um, related but different disciplines. So equity focused education research is um, really miles ahead in this regard. And a great example of that is the work on rightful presence that Angela Calabrese Barton and Edna Tan have done. 
And um, this is, so this is just uh, this um, orange box here on the left is from a practice brief that they developed um, to help people think about incorporating rightful presence in, um, in school settings. Um, and this is just the idea that um, you need to critique power dynamics as part of, of building a sense of belonging among students, especially students who are marginalized in various ways and often in intersectional ways. Um, so that is not only about building a sense of belonging, but also directly addressing the um, political struggles and the inequities that, that contribute to this loss of belonging. So that's one example, but also, and this is something that is, is crystal clear if it wasn't already um, in 2020, because of all of the, the, the growing uh, amplification of anti-black racist um, efforts that are going on right now, or anti-racist and especially addressing anti-black racism efforts, is that community organizers, even if they don't have anything to do with STEM topics, offer so much for inclusive science communication practice. And um, we could be learning a lot more from them and integrating their practices too. And then another one that we wanted to mention is of course the need to create some inclusive SciComm curricula and, um, and learning groups. So shout out to Eris here for this office hours program. This is a learning group. Um, it doesn't, a learning group does not have to be, it can be, but it doesn't have to be a super formal thing. You know, it can be an informal gathering of some people, whether they are undergraduate students or high school students for that matter, or they are, you know, veteran um, uh, broader impacts professionals. The more we can come together and really um, identify how we are and how, most importantly, how we are not practicing inclusion and equity and intersectionality in our work, um, the better off we are <clears throat> in, in improving this, expanding this movement. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, and also, especially, you know, creating these interdisciplinary learning groups and then also the curricula. So if you are someone who has the opportunity to develop curricula, either in courses that you teach or in um, um, trainings that you do or whatever related to this, do it because there's a huge gap and um, there are needs for this all over the place. Um, okay, and the last point that we wanted to make specifically in terms of promising practices, and um, I would like to identify in this picture Evelyn Valdez Ward, who's on the call today. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need some water. <clears throat> Evelyn Valdez Ward is shown in this in this photo. This is from the 2019 Inclusive SciComm Symposium, as well as her colleague Rob Ulrich on the right here. We uh, as part of this, this study, we did a focus group at the 2019 SOCNIS conference. SOCNIS is the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. And the, the focus group was specifically intended to hear from early career scientists and science communicators, regardless of their, their mode, um, to, to share our early results at that point uh, from the study and to hear from them about what they wanted. And, and a really critical finding from that focus group was that a lot of early career um, researchers who are involved in science communication in any way are coming from a foundation of prioritizing inclusion and equity and intersectionality. And so Evelyn Valdez Ward and Rob Ulrich here are, are great examples of this because Evelyn co-founded and um, Rob has been working closely as a collaborator with her the Reclaiming STEM program, which was, um, it's a science communication and science policy training workshop. Um, there's another one coming up soon that was developed by graduate students of color and of marginalized identities for other graduate students who are, um, who have other marginalized identities. And that is novel. Um, that we're seeing more and more of this, but that is such an example of leadership and we need to um, leverage this, these, you know, this expertise and these incredible insights from early career folks 
Um, in, and there are ways that we could do this in terms of engaging graduate students and undergraduate students, for example, in broader impacts projects in much more meaningful ways that provide them opportunities to really have more autonomy and leadership. Okay, so to, to sum up here, um, we want to note again that a lot of what we have said here today is not novel. What, what we think is most important from this study, which again is a snapshot, right, is the recognition that inclusive science communication as a movement can be greater than the sum of its parts. It integrates all of these disciplines and modes and if we do this well, we're going to enhance learning, we're going to minimize duplication, and we're going to improve our outcomes. So that seems like a strong enough argument to us to, to do more of it. So, okay, just to wrap up here, what does this mean for broader impacts? Well, a couple of examples. Um, we can be establishing strategies and, and methods for co-creation and adaptation. And I wanted to note, I'll share this, I can't share anything right now in the um, chat while I'm talking, but. I will share a link to the, um, the resources created by CASE, the Center for Advancement of Informal Science Education Broadening Participation Task Force, which I participated in a couple years ago. And there are all these phenomenal documents that were produced by the, the task force, including um, uh, conversation guides to, for, for organizations to make sure that you're thinking about broadening participation. Um, and practice briefs, like all kinds of great stuff. So definitely check that out. Um, but I also wanted to identify Oregon State's SMILE program here as, as a great example. So um, if you don't know about it, the SMILE program I think is 30-ish years old. Um, that stands for Science and Math Investigative Learning Experiences. And they have these clubs that are rural um, after school programs that are designed to support STEM pathways for underrepresented students. So this is an example of a program that has really been working on these strategies and methods. Um, another thing, thank you, Julie, for sharing that link. Um, another great tip, of course, here is to build asset-based rela relationships in your broader impacts work, not transactional relationships. And a lovely example of that is the 52 Weeks of Science program that Daniel Aguide and colleagues developed at the Fleet Science Center in San Diego a few years ago. And um, Daniel's no longer at, at the Fleet, but um, when he was there, uh, he started by reaching out to the community, um, which was, uh, it's a primarily Chicano community um, and more broadly Latinx, that uh, by saying, hey, instead of going to them and saying, hey, we're going to provide some programming for you, they said, hey, community, what can we do with you, you know, to, to really serve you in ways that are meaningful. And that was um, an excellent program that was very well received. And one of my favorite asset-based programs that they did was one about the science and engineering of lowriders where um, you know, some local community members who build lowriders uh, were the instructors for, or you know, like the, the facilitators for these programs, highlighting the fact that while they may not you know, be engineering faculty, they are doing engineering, incredible engineering to develop lowriders, and they have this rich cultural capital to share. So, great example. Um, and uh, of course, language, as we mentioned before, and also we just want to underscore the fact that there are so many opportunities for evaluation and collaborative research related to inclusive science communication and broader impact. So we really urge you to think creatively about that. And with that, um, we'll stop talking. I'm going to share this last slide because it has some questions that we would love to hear from you about. Probably not today because we want to hear everything else you have to say. But if you have thoughts about these questions and would like to share them with Katie and me, please, please do. Our emails are here and you can follow up anytime. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much, Katie and Sunshine, for that. That was really wonderful. And um, I mean, I've heard you speak before and even I learned a bunch of new stuff. So I, I appreciate you sharing all that with us. Um, we have about 20 minutes and, and there's plenty of time for questions. Um, so um, I'm going to execute moderator privilege and ask the first one and then we'll open it up to other people. Um, I got a bunch and I can't figure out what I want to start with, but I'll, I'll start with this one. So um, 
so how would you hypothetically respond to someone who said, hey, I'm already doing broader impacts and I'm really particular, in particular focusing on the broadening participation component. Um, so by, de you know, by default, I'm already doing inclusive SCICOM because I do broadening participation work. Um, does, that, does that argument hold water or you know, how would you, either of you or both of you respond to that notion that, that just by doing broadening participation work, you're by definition uh, being doing inclusive SciComm. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it does necessarily hold water because often people's, um, people's approach toward broadening participation is really superficial. Um, and obviously, um, the more um, focus there is, thanks to Eris and others, um, on meaningful broader impacts, the less we will see of that, but there is, there's still a lot of very superficial effort going on with regard to broadening participation. So until we see something that is more meaningful and really more, more um, relationship-based and asset-based, and as Danny said, also there's a comment in here earlier about the fact that um, inclusive practice should incorporate empowerment strategies for the communicators and their audiences. I think all of that is just really important and not necessarily included in broadening participation. Katie, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I agree with everything Sunshine said. I think that the other thing is that um, I know in the past when I've done like outreach or other um, activities that are more transactional and in, in that sense, not thinking about the history of the communities that you might be interacting with. So I think that's another part of it too, is like, sure, maybe you're broadening participation, but are you thinking about why? Um, so I think that's another part that I might ask, I might ask them if they thought about that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and I'll ask one more question. I lied, I'm gonna ask two questions and then I'll turn it over to everyone else. But um, how, do you have any thoughts on how to incentivize people to take a more inclusive SCICOM approach to their broader, uh, broader impacts efforts? I mean, other than, you know, that it's the right thing to do, but, but I mean, you know, what, what is the incentive to make people think about that more? Well, there's, I mean, th there's thankfully a growing body of literature that, that can demonstrate the value of, um, of more diverse teams, of more inclusive practices, of more equitable practices. And, you know, so for someone who is like, show me the data, okay, it's out there, let's show it, you know? Um, that's, that's one way, but I, I, yeah, the, <laughs> I think that um, I'd like to think that uh, this crazy year is um, is making people, you know, think very differently in a lot of ways. And um, I am a big proponent of the idea that we need to continue striking while the iron's hot. You know, while we have people's attention, let's continue to elevate these conversations to make sure that they're sustained. Um, and that largely requires some significant um, institutional shifts. So that's a harder part that takes more time. But I think that's a big part of it. You know, like when, when we are lucky enough to work at a place where there are, there's leadership or administrators or whatever who, who get this, um, let's figure out ways to harness that support, you know, meaningfully across our institutions. I don't know. That's not a great answer. It was a tough question. Katie, do you have anything to add to that? Or, okay. <laughs> um, well, I, by the way, I wanna just mention Sunshine. I don't think I've ever gotten through a conversation about broader impacts without giving a shout out to both Nalini Nadkarni and Julie Rizian at some point. So um, I'm glad to see that you did that as well. Um, I'm, I'm sort of keeping an eye on the questions. Um, before I, I bring in any questions from the chat room, I want to actually introduce Julie Rizian, who's my colleague in um, ARIS and on the leadership team with me. And um, because she actually runs a project within ARIS that I think might actually have some relevance and get back to something you mentioned, Sunshine, about, you know, ways to get more involved in, in this fusion of, of inclusive SCICOM and broader impact. So Julie, do you, do you mind just sort of taking a minute to talk about the fellowships? Um, sure. So for those of you, I know many of you do know about this on the call, but for those of you who don't know, ARIS runs a fellowship program. We're about to go into 
uh, accepting applications for our third cohort. I'll put the link in the chat. The applications are due September 30th. Um, and what they are is there's sort of small investments in either synthesis uh, around scholarship and research that's related to broader impacts and advancing broader impacts, um, or they might be kind of new horizon research areas that you want to explore that um, need a little bit <laughs> of an infusion of not only um, support in terms of a stipend, but connection to ARIS as a, as a community and peer support with other fellows to kind of move the idea forward. So the link is in there. We, we have some areas of focus around um, explicitly serving persons with disabilities, um, technical and career training, and uh, development of evidence and critical theory-based resources to support young scientists and engineers who are Black, Indigenous, or persons of color in their pursuit of STEM careers. So there's a lot of space in here for exploring some overlapping themes that um, Sunshine shared. But also, it, uh, proposals don't have to fit squarely into these priority areas. These are just ways for us to help move the community to kind of new horizons. So if you have any questions on that link that I sent, if you scroll down to the bottom, we have a couple of webinars set up for there's Q&A for those. And it's been a really rewarding experience for the fellows who have been part of it this year, especially working together. Um, and they're tackling issues from um, how you approach broader impacts from a climate science lens to um, inclusive mentoring of undergraduate research experiences and all, all kinds of other things too, including um, adapting programming to online and what that means for some of the equity issues that emerge um, that we're not used to really managing. So I'm happy to answer questions uh, at the webinar or you can also feel free to email me anytime. I'll pop my email in the chat. Great, thanks Julie. Um, there was a, a comment and a question from Danny, and I don't have a last name, it just says Danny, D-A-N-I. It looks like you're still on the call, Danny, so um, I could either read off your comment and question, or um, if you'd like, please feel free to unmute and, um, and share your comment and question. Oh, hi. Um, so I guess uh, one of the things I've been learning a lot about has been um, participation in clinical trials, and I see a huge overlap between sci inclusive cyclom and um, diversifying clinical research. Um, so one of the things I recently read about was there's a difference between trust and engagement and empowerment and advocacy. And so I just thought it was an interesting thing to share because um, <clears throat> One of the things they argued is that by having trust and engagement, you kind of um, set the stage for just a certain status quo that doesn't really change and self-evaluate versus empowering someone to advocate and to look at a system and change it uh, as you go along. So I just thought it was kind of an interesting, interesting thing. And that's, that's it. <laughs> Great. Any, any comments or anything to add, Katie, or subtime on that? I would just note that, uh, thank you for sharing that, um, Danny. Um, I, I have I've not seen that specifically, but I think that's a, such an interesting um, and important provocation. And also I wanted to note that in the paper that we published um, earlier this year that Katie talked about earlier, we made a point of talking about STEM with two Ms to include medicine. Um, we did that very purposefully because we were hoping that, that paper was going to be one of the things that people could use to help like, um, it was kind of our flag in the ground, you know, to help people have something to point to, to say like, this is why I need to do this inclusive SciComm work. And anyway, we get that medicine is a huge part of this. So that's why we did that. Can I say something actually, or maybe Lisette, do you want to say a little bit about empowerment and the risk of the word empowerment? <laughs> Uh, I apologize for the kids' music in the background. My children are <laughs> are in the room. Um, yeah, so in terms of social justice circles, I would just say that we talk a lot about avoiding things like giving voice or empowering others because it creates this dynamic where you are the person of privilege and authority and you're bestowing something that they already have 
So communities have power, it's just not recognized or it's not uh, legitimized or fostered. So it's, it's thinking about the language that we use when we're, we're talking about working with communities. Uh, so I would just push back a little bit in terms of using that, using empowerment as uh, something related to working with marginalized communities. Great, thank you, Lisa, for that. Can I follow up with a question real quick? Please. So then what kind of, just out of curiosity, as we're all learning here, so what kind of language would you use to recognize that you're coming from a place of power and that you want to share, not bestow? Um, what I typically talk about is uh, working with and for. So it's more um, a collaborative. Um, so more like talking about uh, collaboration and co-construction rather than I have this information to give to you because I'm sure that they have they either have that information or have that it's in a different form or they think about it differently and you're not necessarily providing them with answers that they don't necessarily know I think about that especially in terms of healthcare where uh, disabled folks in particular are told by medical professionals that their bodies work in particular ways or should be feeling certain things and disabled people have to like advocate for themselves about no this these are the symptoms i've been experiencing and these are and this is why i think i'm developing these things and so um I try to make it more of an invitational, deep, uh, collaborative, co-construction type of terminology. Thank you. I, I threw a, um, a link in there. Something that has been a good example for me is the Thriving Earth Exchange that um, AGU organizes. They, do, they use the terminology community science to describe what they do um, and they, try to give the community equal ownership over the project basically is the goal there. So that's part of another way of thinking about it is making sure that the ownership is equivalent um, to address some of that. Wonderful. Um, I also just want to quickly point out um, in case you missed it in the chat room, Sunshine, I think you posted a few, um, some information, some follow-up questions and opportunities to contribute to your work in your discussion. Do you want to, um, in case someone didn't see it in the chat room, do you want to give a quick shout out to that? Sure. Um, Katie, while I'm doing that, would you mind sharing our emails in the in the chat? Uh, yeah, so thank you for that, um, Jory. So the, the questions we had were, and, and I should note, by the way, that we are finishing this report up really soon. Um, it's supposed to be completed by the end of September. So, you know, we're, we're on it. Um, and we hope to be distributing it in in October. So that means that the sooner we hear from you, the better. But if you have thoughts on this, we really would love to hear. And, and so these are the questions. Um, you know, how might you use this report, um, which is going to go into a, a great deal of detail? Um, are, are there ways that um, you envision using this that could be especially helpful and to advance the field that can help us think about how we're framing it? Um, what's missing? Obviously, we only shared some of the results with you here today, but is there something you really wanted to hear that you didn't? And if so, what and why? And then another question is, how, if at all, has 2020, this mad, crazy year, changed your thinking about inclusion and equity? And to pull up something that Bernardo Mora added in the chat, justice, um, with regard to broader impacts. Great, thanks. Um, we are almost out of time, but um, I've seen a bunch of great comments and um, contributions from both Bernardo Moda and someone named S. Stanlick. I don't know what the first name is there. Um, you know, Sarah, this, sorry. <laughs> Sarah, no, that's fine. But um, this, you know, office hours are not meant to be a, a lecture. It's meant to be a conversation. So I appreciate your contributions. I want to encourage either of you or anyone else on the call 
to unmute and, and contribute, add comments, questions. Um, I mean, for the remaining three minutes, it's an uh, open forum for anybody who has anything to add or share. So this is Sarah. I just uh, briefly, I wanted to make sure that we were also connecting with the long history of work that's happening in the service learning and civic engagement field. Because I, with Lizette's comment about the with versus for, it makes me think of technocratic versus democratic engagement. There are a lot of frameworks and a lot of literature there that I think is in perfect conversation with the work that you all are doing. So I can certainly suggest some things if you haven't already seen that, you might already be completely familiar, but I think just that's important literature to engage with. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sarah. That would be wonderful. We would definitely appreciate it if you would, um, anything that you want to share, we'd love to see it. Thank you. Okay, perfect. And, and that's, um, and, sorry. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to say that um, we, clearly uh, this study is not, we haven't covered everything, so <laughs> we know that, um, but we encourage you all to take this forward in your spaces in ways that are really continuing to push the boundaries and make this more um, interdisciplinary. So that was a, a lovely suggestion, Sarah. Thank you. Great. Well, we are just about out of time. Um, Sarah Vasmer, who's um, the heiress, what is your title? Director of Operations or Grand Poobah or whatever your title is, the person who, <laughs> yeah, who, who, who keeps us all on time and honest. Um, Sarah pointed out that this conversation can and should continue in one of the ARIS communities, which are the online chat rooms that you will all have access to when you get your free ARIS membership. Um, if you scroll all the way to the top of the chat room, I put in the link to um, the membership page for, um, and it's also been posted a few other times since then. So. Again, I want to um, encourage all of you to uh, welcome you to ARIS if you're new to the community, encourage you to join with the free membership, encourage you to continue this conversation in one of the discussion communities or chat rooms. Um, and mostly, I just want to really thank Katie and Sunshine for taking time out of their busy schedule with their deadlines coming up to um, join us today, tell us about the fantastic work they've been doing and just encourage everyone in the ARIS community to think more deeply about how we can pull in inclusive SciComm and make it a, a, a more critical part of what we're doing with broader impacts and research impacts. Um, so with that, I wanna thank you all and wish you good health and stay well and um, hope to see you again at the next ARIS office hours. Thanks everybody very much.